keynote speaker. In W. Mitchell's race for Congress, his slogan was, Oh, yes, he can. Those of us who have watched and listened to him know that he can. In Crested Butte, Colorado, he earned worldwide recognition as the mayor who saved a mountain. Mitchell is the author of It's Not What Happens to You, It's What You Do About It, and he's also a commercial pilot and a whitewater rafter. You could say that he has done it all. This internationally recognized expert on change likes just to be called Mitchell. The public television host has been inducted into the Speaker's Hall of Fame and has received the speaking profession's highest award, the Council of Peers Award for Excellence. He shares his powerful message about taking responsibility for change with audiences around the globe. And now there is someone else who has a few things he would like to say. Ladies and gentlemen, the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. And I saw another friend of mine back here who did not speak to you today, but often speaks at these power within events. His name is W. Mitchell, and he lives in Santa Barbara. And he, um, we've been friends for 25 years. First time we ever met, he was the mayor of the vast metropolis of Crested Butte, Colorado. And I was the youngest governor in America. Um, and I'm... I'm going to use his story to get into what I want to talk about. Because America is in a bad fix and the rest of the world is being affected by it, I hope you won't be too affected by it. But the most important thing is not to sit around and feel bad about the bad fix. The most important thing is to figure out what are we going to do now. So I'll tell you a story about W. Mitchell. When I met him, he was a mayor. And we were talking when I said, how do you deal with this, all this? And he said, well, you know, before I was injured, there were 10,000 things I could do with my life. And this injury was pretty tough, but when I really thought about it, it only took away about 1,000 of those things. So I have a choice. I can spend the rest of my life feeling sorry for myself because of the 1,000 things that are gone, or I can spend the rest of my life feeling good about the 9,000 things that are still out there that I can do. I choose the 9,000. That's what the world has to do now. At 28, W. Mitchell had just made it out of the Marines and landed a good job as a grip man running cable cars through the majestic hills of San Francisco. On his time off, he liked to ride motorcycles. W. Mitchell's life changes in a second when he is badly burned in a motorcycle accident. I became a human bonfire. His recovery pushes the limits of what any human being can bear. I can't describe how painful it was. When Mitchell is tested again by a terrifying plane crash, oh, hold on. he discovers an inner strength he never knew he possessed. Would I trade what I've learned? Not in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, W. Mitchell. Anyone can count the seeds in an apple, and no one can count the apples in a seed. Normally, when I speak to adults, I have a different opening. I ask people a question about adversity and difficulty and I save this one for kids. I save this one for students. But then, after talking to Bob, he let me call him Bob. First he made me call him Mr. President. <laughs> then doctor, professor, but finally he let me call him Bob. 
After talking to Bob, I realized I've probably never talked to a bigger group of students. A bigger group of seed planters. Of people who don't know how many apples are in a seed, but are searching for the answer. Because a lot of what you do is going to make a difference in a lot of people's lives that you'll never meet, never know. And yet here you are. Bob said to me, Mitchell, I'd like you to come and do something this evening. I'd like you to come and remind people that it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it. Because not unlike a whole bunch of other people, this organization has members who have stuff that happens. And sometimes this stuff is unexpected, unwanted, unwelcome. And yet, I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but I've observed in, in my own life, sometimes when a lot of that stuff is happening and you really don't want it to happen, it happens faster. Anybody ever know? And then when you tell it to stop, that's when it really starts to happen faster. And so in life, it's not often easy to control the stuff. So I've chosen in my life to focus on what you do with the stuff once it happens. How you choose to think about it, how you choose to react to it. And that's what I've come to spend a few minutes with you this evening, because you and I are both really anxious to get up to the mariachis. And I hope there's margaritas. There better be margaritas. I had that wonderful job, the job that you saw in the video. I was a gripman on the San Francisco cable cars. Now, wow, what a wonderful opportunity that was. And you, a very well-traveled group, most of you, I'm sure many of you, have ridden on a San Francisco cable car, but some of you are from overseas or from different places, some as far as 40 minutes away, and, uh, and you've, you've come here to the meeting. Is there anybody here, now, foreign visitors, this may not work exactly for you, but is there anybody here who's never seen a rice -a commercial? Yeah, and for the foreign visitors, I'm sorry, it's a commercial about a food product and they use a cable car and a guy rings the bell. And so that was my job, ringing the bell, and, and I, pretty much, I pretty much did what you do. Now I'm getting some funny looks. Now people are saying, wait a second, Mitchell, uh, you had us for a few minutes there, but now we're starting to wonder, uh, you don't look smart enough to do what we do, Mitchell. <laughs> Yeah, this is the, probably the only audience I've ever spoken to where everybody in the room is smarter than me. It's a little embarrassing, but that's okay. That's okay. We're all smart in different ways. That's okay. And, but you see, my job was what your job is. My job was be, to be of service to other people. To help other people. Now you're helping animals, you're using animals in research, and, and I was fascinated uh, why did the name go away? Well, sorry, my friend who I talked to out in the, in the hallway. Oh, okay, it'll, it'll come to me. You know who you are. And you told me something really wonderful about this organization. I was looking and I was asking you questions and I was talking to you and asking all of you lots of, tell me about it and what's important about it. And, and why is it necessary? And he told me the name of this organization when it was founded in 1963. And he told me it was the Animal Care Panel. 
Said it all. Said it all about what you're about, who you are, what you truly care about. And I love that understanding that I got from that very description. <clears throat> but you see, if we choose as a motivator, maybe some of you know his name, Zig Ziglar, famous American motivator. And Zig said something that's timeless, priceless. He said, you can have anything you want in life if you just help other people get what they want first. To be of service to other people. To help other people. I think that's what we're all about. And if that's our focus, then I think the rest follows rather easily. So I loved my job on the cable cars, and with a buddy of mine, we'd served in the Marine Corps together, we took some time off, he from law school, me from my cable car job and, and going to school at San Francisco State University. We took some time off and we took a motorcycle trip. And we decided we'd drove across the Sierra Nevadas and then down through the desert. And this was late June. I'm not completely sure we were as smart as we thought we were. Needles, California, late June. Ooh, hot. Up into the Grand Canyon, finally up into Four Corners. and. Colorado and I fell in love with Colorado and I spent time up there with my buddy we raced our motorcycles <clears throat> met other people came back the following fall bought season passes for Aspen Skiing Corporation and lived in a funky trailer and I hung sheetrock and and but I skied skied almost every day and just loved it and then I began to think about a dream a dream that I had to fly an airplane. I wanted to become a pilot. Anybody here with any unfulfilled dreams? Well, I pursued mine and started my flying lessons up in Colorado. And then in the spring, back in San Francisco, back at my job at the cable cars, San Francisco State. And one afternoon, I went out and bought a brand new motorcycle. The biggest, most powerful motorcycle that money could buy. Very next morning on the bike across the Oakland, San Francisco Bay Bridge, I met a friend from here a little while ago to Hayward, where I got in an airplane and for the first time in my life, I soloed. Solo flew the plane by myself, nobody else in it, nobody there to tell me what to do, nobody there in case I made a mistake. Anybody in this room remember their first solo? Now because of the lights I can't really see hands, but it would be impossible for a group this big not to have a pilot or two or three in the room and we have a special bond but how about the rest of you? What solo are you remembering right now? Oh, when I talk to little kids, I get a hand almost immediately. There's, Mr. Mitchell, I remember the first time I danced in front of my class. And I remember when I rode a bike for the first time. A lot of us in this room, Bob, are a little too old to remember when we rode a bike for the first time, but how about when we drove a car for the first time? I went in a little session a little while ago and there were a bunch of guys with DVM after their name. When you women and men received that degree, what did that feel like? It's interesting, I was thinking about this earlier. I had a wonderful pediatrician when I was a child, just a terrific guy, I don't remember his name. But I remember Dr. Mangetti's name. He was our vet. <laughs> How about the rest of you, you technicians? I watched you come up here and receive your awards and and be recognized for your achievements when you receive those certifications. You guys have a lot of letters after your name, I want to tell you. What did that feel like? When you became the master of your fate, the 
captain of your destiny. Don't forget those moments. Don't forget how proud you were. Don't forget when somebody gives you a hard time about what you do. How many people today on this planet are better because somebody did experiments a thousand years ago? That afternoon, driving my brand new motorcycle to my job on the cable cars at the intersection in San Francisco, 26th and South Van Ness, for those who are from the Bay Area, I must have been thinking about the airplane ride. What a moment in somebody's life. I had to be thinking about skiing, Colorado, Ruthie's Run, Ajax Mountain, wow. Everything but the laundry truck that ran through the stop sign, smashed into the bike, knocked it to the ground. But even then, even then the fractured elbow and the, and the cracked pelvis, those aren't injuries that are going to end somebody's life. But in that split second, a split second that changed my life forever, the, the gas cap popped open. And out poured two and a half gallons of gasoline all over me and the heat of the engine ignited it. I became a human bonfire. Told by witnesses at the scene that day, later they told me, frozen in fear, horrified, terrified. But one person, one person, a car salesman working in a dealership on the corner that day, tore a fire extinguisher from a wall and rushed out into this, didn't wait for permission. Didn't, didn't go find the instruction book. I bet he didn't even stop to check the daily paper to check his horoscope to make sure it was an advantageous time to do something like that. The power of one. The power of one taking action now made all the difference that day. And I see the power of one multiplied in this convention hall today. And I think about you now, this is not one of the greatest hardships in your life to come to San Diego for, the, for this kind of weather and this great meeting, but you're not at the beach right now, I've noticed. You're not at a bar somewhere. You're not shopping. Woody Allen says 80% of success is showing up. I like this job of mine because I get to talk to the people who show up. I get to the pe talk to the people who choose to take action now. Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian professor, University of Toronto, said, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all crew. When Betty and Ann talked to me on the phone at that conference call a few weeks ago, they said, Mitchell, you're going to get to talk to the people who are not just along for the ride you're going to get to talk to the people who have their oar in the water. Thanks to that car salesman taking action now, I was still alive when the paramedics arrived. They rushed me to nearby San Francisco Hospital where a team was waiting for me. Doctors, nurses, technicians, all in the emergency room, as you would imagine. And the rest of the team was there too. Volunteers, janitors, food service workers, administrators, but all the people that made it possible for the nurses to remove the clothes burned to my body, that made it possible for that physician to perform the tracheostomy so that I could continue to breathe. And were it not for the entire team that day, at San Francisco General Hospital, my life would have been extinguished. Two weeks went by 
before I started to come to, before I started to wake up, before I started to realize what had happened to me. And by then the doctors and nurses had decided, maybe, maybe I might live after all. But I had to ask myself the question, live for what? Fingers gone, face gone, 65% of my body horribly burned. What future could there be for somebody like me? The procedures never stopped, round the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, already, all, always somebody coming in the room. Whirlpool therapy, debriding, respiratory care, 15 surgeries, 10, 12 blood transfusions. It never, ever stopped. 2 a.m., 2 p.m., it didn't matter. And on top of everything else, San Francisco General Hospital was a teaching hospital. <laughs> the interns loved me. I was their guinea pig. They had never seen a mess as big as me. They were fascinated. Finally got to a place I couldn't take it anymore. I was never getting enough sleep, literally not more than 30 minutes between visits from somebody to do something for me. And I finally got to a place I couldn't take it anymore. I literally couldn't take it. And I remember, remember one day one of my angel-like nurses, I had two nurses in particular, June Fulbright and Ulan Shaw, who were just remarkable, amazing. And I remember June came in one afternoon and, Mitchell, what's wrong? What's going on? I said, I'm okay, I'm okay. And she said, no, you're not. What's going on? Finally, she called the chief of staff. He came by my room a little bit later and stuck his head in the door. Mitchell, what do you need? What can we do for you? I guess I had one last happy face left because I remember looking up at him and then, Instead of telling him what I was really feeling, I said, Doctor, do you think I could just have a day off? Just a break. Does anybody in this room ever feel that way? Chris is now giving me a dirty look. Chris is now upset with me. Chris said, you were doing great right up until that moment, Mitchell. Chris said, I talked to you, Mitchell. I told you about this group. This group, you generally work, what, about 10 to 3 every day? Is that, is that what you told me, Chris? Something like that. 10 to 3, about four days a week, sometimes three days a week. Your golf games are superb and you I'm, I better get my notes out again, Chris. I think I might have missed, uh, oh, 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 3 a.m. to 10 p.m. I'm sorry, I got that, I'm, I apologize. I'm always fascinated to watch people. I was listening to some of the people who received awards saying this person couldn't be there because they need to be back continuing the work that we're doing together. This person couldn't be there because they have responsibilities and obligations they're taking care of right now. It's again fascinating to see people who've chosen in life not to take the easy way. That great expression that you hear people saying, take it easy, take it easy. Is there anybody sitting in this room today because they took it easy? Easy doesn't do it. Easy doesn't get you what you want to do. The doctor did something amazing. He pulled up a chair, sat down by my bed, asked for my charts. He looked at me and he said, Mitchell, we're not going to kill you trying to save you. Only you know how much you can tolerate. We can't even imagine what you're going through. But as of right now, something in your care is going to change. As of right now, I'm putting you in charge of you. Nothing from now on is going to happen in this hospital that you don't want to have happen. You're going to call the shots. If you don't want something to happen, we won't do it. And what I want to do is go through everything in your 24-hour routine. You tell me what you want changed. 
You tell me what you want stopped. I'll write the orders right now. There'll be no argument, no disagreement from me. And we went through all the procedures, and at the end of the doctor's visit, we found a couple things that we could do every four hours instead of every three. We even found a couple things we could discontinue, stop completely, probably weren't necessary anymore. They were only being done once a day. So at the end of the doctor's visit, very little in my routine had changed, but my whole life had changed. You see, in that moment, for the first time in my life, I realized it was my choice. It was up to me. For the first time in W. Mitchell's life, Mitchell took responsibility for Mitchell. And I use that word advisedly, the word respond. we hear it all our lifetime. You're responsible for the mess in your room. You're responsible for your homework not being done. You're responsible for the paper not being f fulfilled. Or you didn't pick me up on time and now we're all going to be late. It's all your fault. And we, we put fault and blame and guilt so often with that word responsibility that I think we don't realize another and I think better definition of it. Stephen Covey used it in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He, he talked about response-able, the ability to respond. That's the definition I like best. We can spend a lot of time in life, you've probably heard this analogy, I don't know who I stole it from, but it was a, it's such a good one, I use it and whoever it is, take credit for it, I don't know, but, but it's a good one. Do you notice this? I notice it. I drive through life sometime, spending a lot of time in the rearview mirror. Oh, we should turn left back there. Oh, how come I started so late today? Oh, I didn't get gas yesterday, now I'm going to have to stop, I'm even going to be late. Why did it even start the trip at all? Anybody else do that, or is that just me? You see, I would like to change yesterday. I have a bunch of stuff, a bunch of words that I've said, a bunch of things that I've done or didn't do, that I would love to go back and change. I'd change my investment strategy. A lot of stocks I wouldn't have bought, let me tell you. Right now, taking the money out of the market a while ago. and We all would change yesterday, but I can't. I don't think you can. And every moment I spend on that rearview mirror, every moment...